This is a ball guard uh, field. Uh, I mean, we can see some of the rhizoctonia affected plants. You see, if you remove the bark of a healthy plant, it will it won't be like this, like threads. See, it's a classic example of rhizoctonia infestation. The farmers they have said they have never seen that. And uh, when we were doing our study from 2001, we have noted this disease on very few samples in the BT cotton only. And as the time passed, the spread was seen more and more in the BT fields as well as some non-BT fields also. But I personally feel that there may be some interaction, undesirable interaction between the host plant where the gene was introduced and the gene which is carrying the BT. And that has introduced the weakness in the plant to not to resist this rhizoctonia. I have seen the website of the uh, Michael Monsanto. BT cotton reduces 78% of the pesticide reduction, um, and pesticide consumption, and it gives to 30% better yields. But it's, uh, it's an utter flop. After 70, 90 days, you invariably you have to spray for uh, uh, bowl worms, even on the BT cotton. How do you explain that so many farmers are buying BT seeds? See, the, presently the option is very, very na is getting narrower and narrower to the farmer. During the current season, even farmer wanted to go for non-BT. There was no non-BT hybrid seed available in the market. Today in India, Monsanto controls nearly all of the cotton seed market forcing the locals to buy its seeds at prices four times higher than conventional varieties. Small farmers must turn to moneylenders who charge high interest rates. If the harvest is poor, it means bankruptcy, a vicious circle which is decimating Indian villages. Tragedies like the one we've just witnessed occur three times a day in the Bidharba region, where BT cotton was introduced in 2005. Of course, cotton farmers committing suicide is not new in India, but the GM crops are causing it to skyrocket. However, in this battle that pits David against Goliath, few dare to publicly denounce this international scandal. This is Vidarbha's rice growing belt. If you see the minimum suicides are there. But this is the cotton growing area. The result of the BT cotton is the first year 600 suicides from June 2005 to 2006. Second year, still today, within six months, 680 suicides. So, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster, yes. All these technologies, either it is GM or biotechnology, they are actually making the farmers completely dependent on the market. Because not only that you have to pay more for the seed procurement, but you, you have to fertilize it. And there, the, this very claim that no spraying is required, no pesticide is required, is also false. When Monsanto claims in advertising that GM crops are adapted for small farmers. What do you think it's? Our experience shows that it is completely false. It's completely false. It's a lie. On this day in December of 2006, a revolt was brewing in the largest cotton market in the state of Maharashtra. Three days later, riots broke out and dozens of small farmers, including Kishore Tiwari, were arrested. Thirty-two thousand rupees a day. 
Seeds of Suicide is the title of a book by physicist Vandana Shiva. She won the Alternative Nobel Prize and heads the Navdana organization, which aims to conserve traditional seeds. In the beginning, Vandana Shiva's battle was against the first Green Revolution, which brought industrial agriculture to India in the 1960s. Today, she denounces what she calls the second Green Revolution, that of GMOs protected by patents. The difference is that the first Green Revolution was public sector driven. It was driven by government agencies. The government agencies control the research. In the case of the second Green Revolution, it is driven by Monsanto. It is a Monsanto-driven revolution. The second big difference is that the first Green Revolution did have a hidden objective of selling more chemicals. But its first objective was providing food. It was food security. And yes, they grew less pulses, they grew less oil seeds, but they did grow more rice and wheat, it fed people. The second Green Revolution has nothing to do with food security. It's not about food security. It is about returns to Monsanto's profits. That's all it is about. They've always said genetic engineering is the way to get to patenting, but patenting is the real aim. If you look at Monsanto's research agenda, they are testing at this point something like 20 crops with BT genes in them. There's nothing they're leaving untouched. The mustard, the okra, the brinjal, the rice, um, the cauliflower. Once they have established the norm that seed can be owned as their property, royalties can be collected, we will depend on them for every seed we grow, of every crop we grow. If they control seed, they control food, they know it. It's strategic. It's more powerful than bombs. It's more powerful than guns. This is the best way to control the populations of the world. Monsanto responds to Ms. Shiva's persuasive argument by brandishing its pledge, integrity, dialogue, transparency, and sharing. We want to participate constructively in the process by which societies around the world try to develop good answers to those questions. Are the products going to be safe for the environment? How are they going to affect biodiversity? How are they going to affect other plants and insects and birds? What about outcrossing of genes? What happens if, if genes do outcross into wild species? To me, that means, among other things, listening carefully and respectfully to all points of view. Despite Robert Shapiro's placid demeanor, he has just touched on a subject that greatly troubles GMO opponents, transgenic contamination, which Monsanto prefers to call an adventitious presence that's part of the natural order. According to a study led by Berkeley professor Dr. Ignacio Chapella, GMOs have already contaminated Mexican corn. But when the scientific journal Nature published the study's findings, it triggered a violent controversy. I had been working for 15 years with indigenous communities in Oaxaca, in Mexico, and they had been developing the capacity to analyze their environment themselves. One of my students went to try and train people to detect transgenics. We brought with ourselves a positive control that was a can of corn from the US that we knew was transgenic. And 
we were looking for a negative control. And we thought the best negative control is going to be corn from the local places. Because we all believe that was the cleanest, the most um, uh, well-preserved source of corn in the world. So the surprise came when we looked at these samples and we discovered that the samples that we all believed would be non-transgenic had already transgenic DNA within them. It was a very big surprise for us to discover that this, these uh, land races of corn that were kept by people locally and supposedly maintained over 10,000 years had already been reached by transgenic contamination, mostly from the US. Mexico is the center of origin for corn, 